For this week's video, I'll be looking at this four-volume work. It includes two translations from the Latin Vulgate, and it's collectively entitled Wycliffe's Bible. It is, in fact, a color facsimile of Forshall and Madden's 1850 edition of the Middle English translation, or translations, of the Latin Vulgate. Volume 1, as you see here, is Genesis to Ruth. Volume 2 is 1 Kings to Psalms. 1 Kings is known in modern Bibles as 1 Samuel. Volume 3 is Proverbs to 2 Maccabees, so you can see it has deuterocanonical works in it. And Volume 4 is the New Testament, Matthew through the Apocalypse. These volumes are rather large. Each is about 11 and 3 8 inches tall and 8 and 13 16 inches wide. They're nearly the same in thickness, and this stack altogether is about seven and a half inches tall. So each one of them is a little under two inches thick. The paper's thick, and there's little to no ghosting. So in this video, I won't be estimating paper weight. Um, the two translations from the Latin Vulgate are printed in parallel columns. The one on the left is the earlier translation by Wycliffe and Nicholas of Hereford. The one on the right is a revision of that from just a few years later by John Purvey. To give you a sense for the scale, here is a, an ESV study Bible. And as you can see, although the ESV study Bible is thicker than one of these volumes, it's far, far thinner than all four and not as wide or as tall. In case you aren't familiar with John Wycliffe or this, these translations, I recommend you read volume 6 of Schaff's History of the Christian Church. You don't actually need to get a physical copy of this. It is available at archive.org free of uh, charge. The paper copy, however, does have an illustration the beginning of John Wycliffe. So this is the man we're talking about. He is uh, sometimes called the Morning Star of the Reformation. And if you go to section 40, you come to the portion of the history that talks about him. It's 40, 41, and 42, I believe. In section 42, You'll find a bit here about the translation and uh, Purvey's revision. A revision was made of Wycliffe's Bible soon after his death by Purvey. So this is all very good information. I wanted to point out also that the footnote in Schaff's work mentions the work that we are reviewing today. These uh, book blocks are glued, not sewn. If you look carefully here, you can see a line of glue. They uh, are manageable, they're quite flexible, they fairly well will lie open towards the beginning, so that's not an issue. But in terms of long-term term durability, that uh, line of glue may give, give way earlier than stitching would. There is a table of contents in each of the volumes that gives the contents of all four volumes. So volume one is what we're holding now, and it runs from Genesis through Ruth. It also includes the current editor's foreword, the preface to the 1850 edition with a list of manuscripts, and the prologue. This is the general prologue to uh, John Purvey's revision and prefatory epistles from St. Jerome, which are included in the Latin Vulgate. Volume two is First Kings, or First Kingdoms in the uh, Septuagint, which we call First Samuel. It includes the two books of Paralipomenon, which we call Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, First Esdras, which includes the same material essentially, although presented somewhat differently. It's called uh, First Esdras in the Septuagint. Tobit, Judith, Esther, Job, and Psalms. The additions to Esther are present 
as in the Dewey Reams Bible. Volume 3 is Proverbs through 1st Maccabees, and you can see it includes Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus, also known as Sirach. Book of Baruch and 1st uh, and 2nd Maccabees. The additions to Daniel are present, and they are also located as they are in the Dewey Reims Bible. And then the volume 4 is somewhat interesting in a couple of ways. It's the New Testament, but the books aren't uh, ordered exactly as we would anticipate. First, after John, we do not have Acts. We have Romans, and then the Pauline epistles are here, but with the apocryphal work, the epistle to the Laodiceans included. And then we don't have Acts until after Hebrews. Here it's called Deeds of the Apostles. And otherwise the order is the same. At the end of volume four, you have a table of readings for the epistles, the epistles and gospels through the year, a glossary, and a few additional prologues, and then a single page of errata at the very end. On the back of each volume, you'll find some material prepared by the modern editor of this 2019 edition. So I will try to angle it so that the glare is minimal, and you can pause that and read it. I would point out that um, he mentions that they retain the letter YOG throughout, which tends to make sort of a Y or a GH sound. Um, but they replace the thorn, which makes a TH sound, with the TH itself. Then he also says that there's a glossary, which I've found very helpful. Uh, you can contrast these excerpts here, which have the thorn in place, uh, with what we'll see inside. So here's another look at the layout. We have two text columns. They're in paragraph format, so we don't have an indentation for each new verse. A book title at the top of the page. The page number is on the outside, so on the left-hand page it's on the left, on the right-hand page it's on the right, and the table contents, or, I'm rather sorry, the page contents are on the inside. There are verse numbers, as we mentioned, alongside the columns. And you'll see the apparatus at the bottom, we'll talk about this a bit more later, but you have um, annotations, footnotes that deal with uh, textual variants in the left-hand column and in the first section at the bottom of the page, and then the variants that deal with the right-hand column on the right-hand side. So we have this pale goldenrod background. The font, when I compare it to Times New Roman, is about ten and a half points in height. I haven't done that on camera in some time, so let's show you that. So here is a ten and a half point T compared with T in the text. And as you can see here, they're very close. It's somewhat hazy print. It doesn't appear that way on the camera, at least in the excerpts of the video that I've managed to look at so far. Line height, as you can see, is very generous. It's about 13.2 points. Um, the uh, footnotes at the bottom of the page, which we looked at a moment ago, but let's look at again for just a second. They are in about an eight and a half point font. There are also translators marginal notes. Let's see if we can find one of those quickly. Okay, here's one. Marginal notes, as I've seen at least so far in perusing these volumes, um, have to do with the revised translation of Purvey. So here's the title page to Volume 1, Wycliffe's Bible, the facsimile prepared for publication by Michael Everson. This is Volume 1. And at the bottom, which we'll pan down to see, has a little emblem that says Evertype 2019. 
following page we have the copyright page, copyright 2019, first edition 1850, Oxford University Press. We have all the ISBNs down here on the left. And printed and bound by lightning source. On the right hand page we've already looked at the table of contents. Sorry, these volumes are so large, we're having to do quite a lot of panning in the video. And then on the left is the foreword to the 2019 edition. This uh, material, much of it's uh, repeated on the back cover. But you can pause and read this if you're interested. So again, that's the remainder of that. And then you're actually into the 1850 work itself. Holy Bible and New Testaments for the Apocryphal Works and the earliest English versions from the Latin Vulgate by John Wycliffe and his followers, edited by Josiah Forshaw and Frederick Madden. Madden was a knight. And then we come to the preface, and we'll look at a few points in the preface in some detail. It's a rather lengthy work. So the first page of the preface says that the versions now, for the first time printed in an entire form, may be regarded as the earliest in the English language which embrace any considerable portion of the Holy Scriptures. And then they go and discuss earlier translations of smaller portions of the Scriptures. Here in paragraph 25, the editors speculate on the origin of the New Testament translation. They think that um, the Gospels translation was uh, extracted from Wycliffe's commentary, and then these uh, were augmented by translations of the Epistles, Acts, and the Apocalypse, which were translated afresh. It appears to be the work of Wycliffe himself, and then it mentions that there are short verbal glosses frequently introduced into the text, and I intend to show you a couple of those later on. It's interesting here in paragraph 26, they talk about the textual basis for the older translation, and they say it may be assumed for certain that the manuscripts that they label A, K, W, and Y in italics, and that's an important point that they're slanted characters, represent most accurately the text as it stood at first and then G, M, and P generally agree with those. Then in paragraph 27 of the preface, it notes that regarding the Old Testament translation, there is a copy um, that has a note at the end assigning the translation of the Old Testament to Nicholas Hereford. The note was evidently made not long after the manuscript was written, and there need be no hesitation in giving full credence to its statement. So they are ascribing the Old Testament translation to Nicholas of Hereford. Um, but he apparently broke off the translation somewhere in the book of Baruch, and they believe that the translation itself affords proof that it was completed by a different hand and not improbably by Wycliffe himself. Now, apparently for some time, at least until the 1830s, there was some confusion about whether the right-hand column text or the left-hand column text is earlier. And here in paragraph 34 of the preface, the editors give their reasoning for assigning the later date to the translation on the right. They say it comports with the uh, philosophy of translation in the general prologue, and the general prologue is definitely the work that, that corresponds to the later translation. Then in regard to the authorship of the later translation, you'll find this sentence in paragraph 44, and it may therefore be regarded as undeniable that Purvey was also the author of the general prologue, and consequently of the later version of the Bible to which it belongs. 
Toward the end of the preface, you come across a list of documents that are used as, used as sources. In the Old Testament, for the earlier version, you'll see A, B, C, with uh, names of documents beside them. The A and the B and the C are in an italic font, and it continues on the next page with various other letters of the alphabet. And then the later version, they've enumerated or designated with uh, standard perpendicular characters, the source documents there. And this goes on for another couple of pages with documents from the New Testament for the, both the newer and the later versions, and then for the preface and the general prologue. General prologue, they use uh, Greek letters throughout. Preface, they use uh, lowercase letters with Greek letters at the end. Now, um, if you wanted to know more information about A, say, source document A for the Old Testament and the earlier version, you would go to the next list and look for number 94. Now remember this is Corpus Christi College, Oxford 4. So let's see what number 94 is called. We'll go back here to the list of manuscripts and find our way back to 94. And we see CC College number 4. And then we have a description of the document. So that's the purpose of the list of manuscripts at the end. The list of manuscripts here, earlier in the preface, is the manuscripts that they've used to create this particular edition. And the list of manuscripts is a more thorough description of these manuscripts. It goes on for some pages before one comes to the prologue. The prologue is uh, Purvey's general prologue, and here in chapter 1, he is giving the canon of scripture, and as I read this, he's agreeing with Jerome, and taking a view that uh, the deuterocanonical books are not a part of the canon. After Purvey's general prologue, we come to the prefatory epistles of St. Jerome. They're given in both translations, the original and the revision from a few years later. And it's kind of interesting, I'm going to try to read it, putting it into modern English. I will not attempt to pronounce it as it may have been pronounced in the 1380s. Brother Ambrose, to me, thy little gifts perfectly bearing, hath brought with, and write sweet letters, the which hen showed soft, soft fastness of now proved faith, here in Genesis, uh, neither translation appears especially difficult to read, at least here in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning God made of naught heaven and earth. Forsooth the earth was idle and void, and darkness was on the face of the depth. And the Spirit of the Lord was born on the waters. And God said, Light be made, and light was made. And God seized the light, that it was good, and he departed the light from darkness, and he called Clepid, Clepid, the light day, and the darkness night. Again, I don't uh, have any idea how this would have been pronounced in the 14th century. So my plan for the rest of the video is to show you the material here in the back of Volume 4, which we haven't looked at yet, and then we will spend some time looking at familiar passages in the older translations. Finally, I intend to look at um, how, to what extent, the uh, Wycliffe translation moved away from using church language, like uh, words like church and chalice and penance and bishop and priest, before we conclude. So here's a table of lessons. You remember uh, both. Wycliffe and uh, Purvey were Catholics. So you have a table of lessons with the readings, epistles, and gospels here in this section, which goes on for quite a way until we get to the glossary, which is very useful. Uh, unfortunately, I found some uh, that some words I've wanted to know the meanings of aren't in the gloss glossary, but that's rare. Generally speaking, they are here. Glossary is in rather a small font. 
So it looks like about a seven to me, or smaller. And we'll take a look in one or two places. When we look at uh, specific passages, we will look back to the glossary to get the meanings of words in one or two cases. But I wanted to give you an overview here to show you the extent of it. And here are some additional prologues that for one reason or another did not make it into the main manuscript of this publication itself. So those were not sorted in place. And then finally we have a list of errors, corrections, which uh, one could make in pencil in these four volumes. Next, here's that um, dramatic moment in the 45th chapter of Genesis where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And I think it's a bit easier to understand here in Pervy than over here in the Wycliffe Hereford translation. Um, Joseph might no longer abstain himself while many men stood before. Wherefore he commanded that all men should go out and that no aliens were present in the knowing of Joseph and his brethren. And Joseph raised the voice with weeping, raised his voice with weeping, which Egyptians heard, and all the house of Pharaoh. And he said to his brethren, I am Joseph, liveth my father yet? Second passage, here is Exodus chapter 20, the beginning. And the Lord spake all these words, I am thy Lord God, that led thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of servant, servage. Thou shalt not have alien gods before me, thou shalt not make to thee a graven image, neither any, O-N-Y, any likeness of thing which is in heaven above and which is in earth beneath neither of the things that bend in waters under earth. Here is a famous section in Ruth which is broken, so we'll have to do it in parts. To whom Naomi said, Lo, thy kinswoman turned again to her people and to her gods. Go thou with her. And she answered, Be thou not adversary to me, that I forsake thee and go away. Whatever thou shalt go, I shall go, and where thou shalt dwell, and I shall dwell together. People is my people, and thy God is my God. What land shall receive thee dying, I shall die therein, and there I shall take place of bearing. God do to me these things, and add these things if death alone shall not depart me and thee. Here is a passage toward the end of the first chapter of Job. Then Job rose and cut his clothes, and his head shaven fell into the earth, and honored, and said, Naked I went out from the womb of my mother, and naked I shall go again thither. The Lord gave, the Lord took away, as to the Lord pleased, so it is do be the name of the Lord blessed and all these things Job sinned not with his lips nay any folly thing again God spake here's the beginning of the 23rd Psalm which uh, is the 22nd Psalm in the Vulgate um, the Psalms of course are numbered as they were in the Vulgate here a little easier to read on the right and the left uh, the Lord governeth me and no thing shall fail to me in the place of pasture. There he hath set me. He nourisheth me on the water of refreshing. Here's the ending of the same 22nd, 23rd Psalm. Thou hast made fat mine head with oil, and my cup filling greatly is full clear. And thy mercies shall sue me in all the days of my life and that I dwell in the house of the Lord in the length of days. This section is from the ninth chapter of 
Uh, the book of Isaiah, forsooth, a little child is born to us, and a son is governed to us, and princehood is made on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful a Counselor, God Strong, a Father of the World to Come, a Prince of Peace. His empire shall be multiplied, and no end shall be of his peace. He shall sit on the seat of David, and on the realm of him, and he confirm it and make strong in doom and righteousness from henceforth until the without end, until into without an end. Here we are now in the third chapter of John's Gospel. And there was a man of the Pharisees, Nicodema by name, a prince of the Jews. And he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we witten that thou art coming from God, Meister. For no man may do these signs that thou doest, but God be with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Trebly, trebly, I say to thee, but a man be born again, he may not see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How may a man be born when he is eld, whether he may enter again to his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus, Jesus answered, Trebly, 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 I say to thee, but a man be born again of water and of the Holy Ghost, he may not enter into the kingdom of God. So as a final sample, we'll look here in the 22nd chapter of the Apocalypse. And he said to me, Sign, ether, seal, thou not the words of prophecy of this book, for the time is nigh. He that knoweth, knoweth he yet, and he that is in filth, wax, fail yet, wax foul yet, and the just man be justified yet, and the holy be hallowed yet, lo, I come soon and my mead with me, to yield to each man after his works. I am Alpha and U, the first and the last, beginning and end. Blessed be they that wash their stoles, that the power of them be in the tree of life, and enter by the gates to the city. Since John Wycliffe was burned as a heretic about 30 years after he died and his ashes were cast into the river Swift, I thought it would be interesting to check his translation in a number of places, like here in Luke 118. And um, here it reads, The angel gone in to her said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord be with thee. Blessed be thou among women. And the newer translation by Purvey is very similar. And both are rather like the 1582 Douay translation, which has, Hail, full of grace. Our Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. The uh, Wycliffe translations uh, both used other ecclesiastical terms like ordain and priests, ordain by cities, priests, or ordained priests by cities. So you have both the term ordain and you have the term priests. Then a bit later, in uh, we're in Titus, this is Titus 1 verse 7 here, it behooveth a bishop for to be without crime. It behooveth a bishop to be without crime. And um, it's pretty much carried over into the Reims translation from 1582, which has ordained priests by cities here, and then a little later, for a bishop must be without crime. Because this is a translation from the Latin Vulgate, you would anticipate that it would have the woman defeating the serpent, and that's what you have here. Um, uh, enmity I shall put betwixt thee and the woman, and thy seed, and the seed of her, she shall tread thine head, and thou shalt aspy to her heel. Uh, this is where the glossary in the back of volume 4 comes in handy. For here we find the verb spies, to lay in wait, or to watch privily. 
In Mark 14.23 and the 15.82 Reims translation, you see the term chalice being used and taking the chalice, giving thanks, he gave to them. But in the older translations, from the Latin, you see, and the cup taken, and when he had to take the cup, so they're using the older, more Anglo-Saxon sounding term cup rather than chalice. Some modern translations avoid the word church quite frequently, but here in the Wycliffe translations you see the word church being used. Um, Jesus said to Simon Barjona, I say to thee, for thou art Peter, and upon the stone I shall build my church, and the gates of hell, so forth. And you see the same thing here in Acts. This is chapter 7, verse 38, in the church in wilderness. In the church in wilderness. In the 1582 Reims translation, Jesus uh, began to preach and to say, do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You might anticipate that, a, that in a Wycliffe Bible you would have something other than do penance, perhaps repent. But no, both translations say, Do ye penance, do ye penance, for the kingdom of heavens shall come nigh. So we saw earlier the term priest was used and the term church, and both terms are used here in James 5.14. I also wanted to use this to point out that certain glosses from the translators are in an italic font here in this translation, like the word man. A sick man. Here is another example of a translator's gloss here in Ephesians 1 4, or undefouled in his sight and charity. Here in 1 Corinthians 13, you see that both the Wycliffe and the Pervy translation use charity rather than love here in 1 Corinthians 13 as do most of the older translations, like the King James Version. To some people, it's important that uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 be translated with the Church of the Living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That is, it's the only pillar and ground of the truth. That's the way it's translated in the 1582 Reims translation, but here in both the Wycliffe translation and the Purview translation, we have a pillar. And that is the Church of Living God, a pillar and sadness, which means firmness, I think, of truth. We could look it up if we wanted to take the time in the glossary. We're still in the same book and in the same chapter, but now down in verse 16 of 1 Timothy 3. And I'm just showing you the Chaloner revision from the 1750s. Evidently great is the mystery of godliness, and then it goes on with the doxology about the Incarnation. Um, that is an alteration, that word mystery is an alteration from what was in the original Reims translation. The original Reims had the word sacrament, sacrament of piety. Manifestly, it is a great sacrament of piety. So. How did the Wycliffe and Purvey translations read there? Well, they have a sacrament of piety in both places, a great sacrament of piety or pity. Some new translations have gotten away from only begotten as the translation in John 1.18, but those, that translation goes back at least as far as Wycliffe and Purvey here. Um, because Wycliffe has uh, un begotten son, uh, which is the way it reads in Purvey as well. And for those of you who are interested in textual issues, it um, is true that both translations include this additional material in 1 John 5, 7. Uh, there have been three that, given witnessing in heaven, the fodder, the word, or Son, here's a gloss, an explanation, and the Holy Ghost, and these three been one. For three been that given witnessing in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three been one.
The uh, King James Version uses the term bowels of mercy, and more modern translations have gotten away from that and use something like hearts here in Colossians. This is 3.12, but um, both uh, Wycliffe and Pervy have entrails of mercy. Psalm 145 is Psalm 144 in uh, the Vulgate. And I was happy to see here in Psalm 144.13 that it contains this additional language that um, more modern translations are beginning to include, at least in square brackets, faithful the Lord in all his words, and holy in all his works. Someone who saw my video on the gender-neutral approaches of the NRSV and the NIV wanted to point out to me how old the, the uh, singular they is. And I referenced this verse in Ecclesiasticus, uh, chapter 38, it's numbered 35 here. All these and their hands, hoped, I guess that's hope, hoped, and Eshan in their craft is wise, each, so each in their craft. So this is singular and it then has this plural pronoun referring back to it. So this certainly does look like a uh, singular they way back in the 14th century. I think it's interesting, though, that um, Purvis changed it. And he says all these men hoped or hope in, in her hands. Her, actually, at the time, if you look back here in the uh, glossary, it actually means there. So these plural men hope in their hands. And each man is wise in his craft. So uh, Purvis, I think, knew his grammar better than Wycliffe did and corrected that singular day. Now let me show you the glossary if I can find it. Her is there. While we're talking about pronouns, it's kind of interesting here in Genesis 1.27 where we see this pronoun, hem. God made of not hem male and female, and God blessed him and said, but it's H-E-M, not H-I-M or H-Y-M. So if we look here in the glossary, if I can bring it over and put it in the focus, we see that hem means them. Well, I hope this has been a useful summary to you of the contents of this reproduction of the Four Shaw and Madden 1850 edition of two translations. Latin Vulgate. I think um, the only real negative from my perspective is the glued binding. Um, I don't mind it being hardback. I think the paper is quite good. It's nice and thick. Um, you're not going to be carrying these volumes to church. Um, so the portability is not really an issue. It's good that they're so large uh, as to allow the fonts to be large. The uh, apparatus at the bottom of the page is perfectly readable even if it isn't a smaller font than the 10 point font here which is uh, not bad at all it's a bit on the hazy side but i haven't noticed any difficulty from that uh, blurry lack of crispness i would like to point out that there are occasionally pages that aren't quite as crisp as they could be for instance, in my copy, page 348 in volume 1 is hazier than the others, but it's still readable. So I don't consider that a major issue. It's a very thorough academic work. I think uh, historians, uh, theologians, university libraries, um, seminary libraries would do well to have a copy of this on their stacks as a reference work. Certainly I'm going to be comparing translations, um, particularly other translations from the Vulgate, but occasionally from more modern translations to both the Wycliffe and the uh, Pervy translations in the future. Apologies for calling uh, Pervy Purvis at points in the video. I've known people named Purvis, but I've never known a Pervy Oh, I'm not all that articulate of a person anyway. Well, thanks very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. I want to thank the publisher for providing this copy for review. 
And um, if you've enjoyed the video, remember to hit the like button. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please feel free to do so and tell your friends. Thanks very much.